You know, I don't typically see strong arming as the best way to get results. Still, sometimes you're left with no choice but force. You'll I'm have sorry, the do you have an appointment? You wouldn't you dare. Oh. oh God! Making videos is hard. It's super time consuming. For that and a variety of other reasons, I've kind of stopped doing it for a while. Having said that, I didn't stop playing games. I didn't stop recording them either. I have four terabytes of footage for videos I didn't make. At some point, I have to start making videos about these games or get to deleting that footage. This video is gonna be a super cut of my truncated thoughts on some of those games that I played in the last year and a half or so. That way I can have a solid reset and move on to working on stuff that really interests me. First, let's talk about Cyberpunk. I fucking love this game. I played it before the launch of the DLC and before they reworked so much of the game with the giant patch. If I did have thoughts on the game's mechanics or the character builds, those thoughts are outdated by now. In fact, I had quite a few thoughts, to be honest. I wanted to make a big full retelling of my playthrough for this game, but I hated every version of my script. I felt like I was white knighting for the game and defending its flaws because of what it did so well, and there are so many things about this game that were so successfully done for me. The game launched in an abysmal state, and many people felt scammed. I played the game over a year after the release, and the online discussions seemed to be permeated by angry players still. As of now, it seems more of the focus has been drawn onto what the game does well after a successful DLC launch and an anime, but just because I love Cyberpunk doesn't mean that my experience was without flaws. I finished a quest and watched my quest giver return to her home planet in front of me. Go get a stiff drink. Cool your nerves. Take care, Blue Moon. That was pretty wild. I loaded into the game and one of the drivers decided to go full farmer's market for some reason. Back. So then, did you all hear about that Arasaka aircraft carrier just in the city? Whoa! <laughs> okay. Have they fixed the AI drivers yet? Back when I was playing, trying to be a rule following driver was the quickest way to break the AI. There were lots of bugs, and many of them happened while I was driving. Speaking of the driving, I had problems with the way the cars drove with a keyboard and mouse. The cars are all just lightning fast future tech. With a WASD control scheme, you don't have analog throttle control. This means that you're just flooring it, so within three seconds, you're likely careen off a wall or another vehicle if you don't pump the brakes. At the time, I was having random... I don't want to say I was having random Xbox controller issues. I just straight up had bad controllers. <laughs> but I highly recommend you use a controller for driving in this game. Maybe that's just a limitation of the input method more than a glaring flaw of the game. But either way, like all of that is to say Cyberpunk wasn't perfect. There, I admitted it. Bugs aside, the presentation on Cyberpunk was absolutely incredible. Obviously, the game looks breathtaking, but it's not just that. All the voice actors portray their characters perfectly. I mean, so, sometimes you just be having a random conversation with someone that wasn't even a, like a very major story point, and it just felt like you were getting somebody's Oscar performance. Hey, you! What are you doing here? Fuck, Cynthia. Told you to make sure nobody followed you. Husband sent me. Suspected something. What? See who was Wait. right. No! It's it's not like that. I I can explain. Go on then, let's hear it. Okay, for, for one thing, he's not my input. He's my ripper. A specialist in plastic surgery. A specialist in this dump. Look, I know. I I had this little accident a few years ago. The victim, uh, 
Well, the patient's family still can't let it go. That's why I'm forced to work here. Hold on a sec. Uh, what about your kid? Here's the thing. I... Oh. I didn't used to look like this. I had a total body sculpt. Skin, hair, eyes, everything. Except, well, you can't fool your genes. Night City was beautifully designed and insanely well realized. When you consider the bleeding edge visuals with superb framing, the story is told in such an engaging way. Games that are graphical showcases usually have more limited interactivity. I've grown to believe that the better a game looks, the less systems I will expect to be able to engage with. Cyberpunk and Baldur's Gate have proven that philosophy very wrong this year. They're both some of the best looking games of their respective genres, and they also reward you with a ton of interactivity. Cyberpunk gives you moments of almost immersive sim levels of options for quest completion. There's always multiple access points to a given area, and you always have the option of going loud or being a ghost. Then you have the options given to you by the character build diversity. I went with a Netrunner build, and it was insanely overpowered. I was a literal god who can stand in the back making the enemy's cyber implants malfunction from afar. Nothing like setting one guy on fire from the inside while making another pull the pin on their own grenade in a crowd. We have a couple of scavs here. These guys are kind of scumbags. Um, they're just generally all around the world. Um, I could just take this guy. How about I take this guy right here and make him detonate a grenade? Then I'll take her. I think she's just done with this world. Die, oh, he can't stop himself. I guess the suicide was kind of extra, wasn't it? Netrunner is absolutely easy mode. Meanwhile, my friend built a cyber samurai. Check this shit out. It's hard for me to focus on the bugs when I'm able to do stuff I've never been able to do in a real-time combat system like this. If you play as a completionist, you will become a modded out god, and that's the kind of thing I can get behind. If you're going to have these kinds of progression systems, let me feel the progression, please. I know the skill trees have been reworked since I played, but the cyber mods and the skill trees gave me so many customization options that tangibly changed my playstyle. The choice and consequence was handled really well too. Once I finished the game, I saw a ton of YouTube videos with people handling quests totally differently than I did and having wildly different results. Your choices can alter your relationships with characters forever. Since this isn't a retelling, I'm dancing around spoilers, but there's multiple junctures where you're asked to pick a side. In some cases, this led to the deaths of characters that could have been allies all the way to the game's finale. To be honest, if you're a character in Cyberpunk, your life is not guaranteed. Some people die due to built-in scripted moments, and many more lives can be taken or saved based on player decision making. This kind of thing is not unheard of in CRPGs, where the graphical fidelity asks a lot less of devs to implement those kind of branching decision trees. For a first-person game with this kind of production value, to me, I think this is unheard of. At launch, I saw a lot of conversation regarding your, how your choice of a starting background has little effect on your story. This might have had to do with how they set the game up and presented it to the public. I don't know. I wasn't. I was trying to stay in the dark about it. But that's true. It mainly acts as a framing device at the beginning of the game, and then it gives you role-playing options and conversation as the game opens up to you. I didn't care myself, as I had no preconceived notions of how essential those background choices would be. 
when I choose my background in most CRPGs, I don't have the expectation that it'll change my starting location and what path my story will take. I think Cyberpunk did plenty enough to satisfy me in this regard, even though they could have gone further with it. I found it really interesting what they did with the quests. The main campaign is actually fairly short, maybe 30-ish hours. The bulk of Cyberpunk lies in its side quests. Once I finished the game, I realized how much of the things that I did were actually optional and it blew my mind. It shows a lot of confidence in the content you made for the game when some of the best parts of it could be conceivably skipped. There are whole character arcs that can be bypassed to some beelining of the main story. To be fair, that person is only getting access to the lousier endings that way. And I mean, one of the endings is a real bad ending. I mean, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad ending. But it's still possible to finish the game while missing out on whole character storylines. I did every side quest, MCPD scanner mission, gig, and cyber psycho mission. The deeper I got into the game, the more I enjoyed role-playing as my version of V. I'm the type of person who likes to live with the consequences of my choices in most games, but I'll be the first to admit I saved scum several scenarios in Cyberpunk. Sometimes I just wanted to see how things would play out if I did things different. Other times I just didn't like what happened. Also, I may have gotten murder happy at times. When the game started, I was playing my V as I do in most of all RPGs. I was Han Solo. I'm a good guy who will do bad things if it gets me to a net good. After a few hours in Night City, I changed. The city changed me. Night City was awesome and terrible at the same time. It's beautiful and it's ugly. The more you're immersed in Night City, the more you see the way everyone around you acts completely selfishly. It's the ultimate dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's kill or be killed. This is the post-apocalypse, after all. Hell, they even go into detail about how protein sources are limited, so people are mostly eating locusts or worms for their meat. Even the people running the city are still living in the post-apocalypse. Their burger is likely still made with the same mystery meat as V's. Maybe better quality mystery meat, I don't know. There are very few do-gooders roaming around. Even those characters you will empathize with likely will have their own self-interested reasoning behind their actions. Most people are outright pieces of shit, and you'll often be siding with the best of two bad options. Hell, even the NCPD isn't Night City Police Department. It's Night Corp PD. They're more interested in protecting corporate interests than human lives. The NCPD scanner missions are basically calls for NCPD that they're handing out to contractors so they don't have to deal with it. The literal first mission of the game has Jackie and V rescuing a woman named Sandra Dorset, who has a biomonitor that went offline. After busting in on some scumbag, she's found in a bathtub full of ice at death's doorstep. Once she's back on the network, a response team shows up immediately to rescue her, and Jackie and V are immediately asked to step away and given no fanfare for their rescue. She has the ultimate life insurance policy. The super rich have purchased damn near immortality. The moment one of these rich bastards have any health complication, these crews swoop in to immediately save them. Cyberpunk could have told you about the haves and have-nots, Instead, it shows you firsthand right as the game begins. I played my playthrough as a Corpo V. He had a taste of the good life in the beginning until a series of events leaves him to fend for himself on the streets of Night City, the true definition of the penthouse to the outhouse. This was the one and only playthrough I've done so far, but it gave me early context to be the base for my V character. I decided that V lived the good life, but now he also saw the dark side of the ruling class, so now he was going to make his name with his friend Jackie while striking back at those that harmed him and his loved ones. That person isn't really going to be concerned with breaking a few eggs to make an omelet, so I didn't concern myself with that either. Earlier I mentioned the bad ending. This isn't a spoiler video. And don't you dare complain about me describing the first fucking mission either. Anyways, but I, I want to say that cyberpunk endings were awesome. I did every route except for the secret ending that required a very specific path to open to me. I liked every ending except for one that I won't specify. If you played it, there is one ending that is very clearly fucking stupid. And you know. 
Cyberpunk endings aren't a simple title card or a brief cutscene showing a different result either. They are complete alternate paths that entail completely different companions or alternate gameplay routes. I was satisfied with the journey and the destination here. If you haven't played Cyberpunk, the endings are worth putting in the legwork for. Once I started writing this, I realized I could easily make this into yet another long-ass failed cyberpunk script. If I start talking about the individual missions, I, I won't stop. For now, I'm going to stop here. I have so many thoughts about cyberpunk, but it opens too many doors. Maybe next playthrough I'll record again and come with a better plan and footage of an improved game that won't make me want to add caveats to a recommendation. This is one of my favorite games now in spite of the blemishes to my experience. That's the most important part of this message. The people here, they don't seem to know about the bad things. Bad things? Everything that's happening outside. I think they do know. They just feel safe here. You will too. After one technical showpiece of a game, I went straight to another. My reasoning for not making a video on this game was simple. Plague Tale Requiem is the sequel to A Plague Tale Innocence. Although I had played the original, I didn't want to replay it and record it to make a recap for that as well. Requiem starts shortly after the end of the first game, which is a bold choice. You can play the sequel and it will fill in the events of the first title, but you're honestly really missing out. I like Plague Tale Innocence and Requiem. At this point, I'm just a big fan of Asobo who made these games. To start with, god damn these are some pretty games. The French landscapes are breathtaking when they aren't being hideously menacing. What's really technically impressive to me was the lighting and facial capture. Well, and the rats. Swarms of goddamn rats. The Plague Tale franchise punches above its weight class by having stellar voice performances and superb framing for the cutscenes to keep story moments from becoming overly dry. These games follow the adventures of Amicia Darun and her younger brother Hugo. Hugo has a rare blood disease referred to in lore as the Prima Macula. He has the ability to summon rats from the earth and sometimes control them. Considering this game takes place in 1349 in France, those powers are very relevant to the moment. The powers that be want Hugo for their own purposes. The first game does a good job of establishing Amicia's strained relationship with her younger brother. In that game you got to experience as their familial bond strengthened. And as Plague Tale Requiem starts, she has become somewhat of his caretaker. No, more of his bodyguard. No matter who comes after Hugo, Amicia will do whatever it takes to protect him. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not the biggest fan of children in video games. They tend to be obnoxious. Having said that, I fucking love Hugo. The voice actor, Logan Hannon, did a fantastic job. The character of Hugo has been thrust into an incredibly tough situation that he has no control over. He's naive while also being wise behind his ears at the same time. He's emotionally intelligent. His sister is crazy protective by the start of Requiem, and he sees her actions for what they are, a sister trying to keep her beloved brother safe. Sometimes Amicia doesn't exactly have it together in this one. She just knows she has to protect her brother. I think because I'm a dad, I have the same instinct she does. I want to take care of this kid. The gameplay of Requiem is fairly simple, but they do a good job of building on small mechanics as the game ran on to keep things fresh. Usually, the pair will encounter an area filled with hostile enemies that will have to be navigated sneakily. Amicia has a sling that can knock out some of the weakest enemies, but she's no soldier. Usually, her armament is used as a tool of distraction to make noise or otherwise lure enemies away. Requiem also takes note of how you're dealing with your problems. If you're using her armament to stealthily sneak by everyone, her sneaky abilities will be buffed. 
If you're the harbinger of death, her alchemical powers and other offensive capabilities are enhanced. The surrounding characters in the story will also take note if Amicia is excessively killing everyone in her path. Her sling is often also useful for puzzle solving. I hope you're not scared of rats because the absolute flood of rats that will bombard your screen is biblical. The rats fear the light, so you often have to light a torch or navigate a fire pit or use your sling to light a bonfire to negotiate forward. While the game isn't necessarily challenging your gamer skills at all times, they do a good job of making combat and exploration feel like a puzzle that you're solving. There were times where I found a path to perfectly avoid all hostiles and I felt like I cracked the code. As such, I never got tired of the loop. Plus, the game looks like this. For fans of games with gripping and emotional stories, I highly recommend that you play both of the Plague Tale games. I may or may not have cut some onions once or twice during this one. I got attached to the characters and I was living and dying with them through their trials and tribulations. Their stories feel grand and personal at the same time, and the characters have lingered in my mind. Fresh dissolve with me bare hands. We could in pixies, humans. Oh, you got him good. And who are you? Another pest? Think you rule the world just because you got a scary face? Ha! As the symbol glows, power courses through you. Authority. <laughs> well, not us. Things are changing. We got the absolute on our side now. You better learn your place. Go on. Kiss my foot. Or I'll kick your head in, on face. Nothing like picking a fight with a with a goblin in Did the I middle of a giant. We just saved, so. I'm not gonna intimidate him. Oh, nice. I ain't kissing no goblin boots. Uh, I'll tell you look, that right mate, now. Just piss off. You're not welcome here. Hmm. Don't push Aww. it, worm. I can still I, push your I didn't want to press my luck. I didn't want to press my luck. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. Freaking Oh, coward. and it didn't even. Oh my God. I wow. literally got the whole camp. It is the whole camp. Baldur's Gate 3 is one of the best games I've ever played. I'm not really the video SAS guy. Um, but this game will inspire that kind of passion in someone. I saw a lot of discourse about this game everywhere. There were multiple camps that were engaged in these conversations. One of those camps was a group that liked the idea of Baldur's Gate 3, but weren't going to give it a try because of the turn-based combat in the game. I want to directly speak to that camp now. This is going to diverge from a Baldur's Gate for a moment, um, but I promise I'll circle back. I play a lot of RPGs specifically. I grew up on JRPGs that were turn-based. I played a lot of CRPGs in the early 2000s, a fire which has been relit thanks to Baldur's Gate 3. A lot of those CRPGs use a combat system called Real-Time with Pause. This is something in between actual real-time combat and turn-based. However, most of the RPGs I've played in recent times have been some type of real-time combat. Based on all this worldly experience, I could say that I like good combat, whatever form that takes. I've played really terrible turn-based systems and really great real-time action combat. The opposite is also true. I'm gonna start this rant by espousing the virtues of a turn-based or some type of pause solution to combat. The new Final Fantasy VII Remake is real-time with a pause solution to deal with your extensive ability list and companion abilities. I love what they've done to revamp the original turn-based combat. I believe that in this case, the juice was worth the squeeze. I also have to say that Final Fantasy has not had a good magic and summon system since Final Fantasy X, in my opinion. It's not a coincidence that Final Fantasy X was also the last implementation of an active time battle system. 
don't come at me Final Fantasy 13 friends. One defining feature of the classic Final Fantasies is the party system. You usually have control of three to five different characters per battle. This is simply not feasible to control in real time. You can have friends and companions in a game with real time combat, but if I can't control them or use them in combat, I personally find it harder to take ownership in their plight. This usually means you have to choose who to control or pause the combat in some way to use your companion's ability in most games. In Final Fantasy Remake, I have Barret and Aerith, and they travel and fight with me. When I get to use a companion's abilities to save me, I get to see their value firsthand. I get to feel their tangible worth. In the case of Final Fantasy VII Remake, I also get their banter with Cloud, which makes their close relationship and growth more believable. Having a larger party often means that your party members can play off each other. One character can cast rain and another can cast lightning on the puddle, for instance. Maybe you can have your wizard to move your rogue to the shadows where he can use his sneak attack. I don't know, you, you get the point. This kind of interplay is difficult to execute in real time. Usually if a game is real time, you're going to have a lot less interactivity with your party and the environment around it. And quite simply, in games with a larger roster, it's just often the case that a real time combat system doesn't make as much sense. There are more possible benefits to a non-real-time combat system. I mentioned magic and summons before. Trying to navigate these things in a real-time system is a technical nightmare, especially in games made for consoles. You can have hotkeys with 40 abilities in WoW because a keyboard has a ton of keys. There are finite numbers of buttons to map on a controller after all. There's a reason you have so few options for skills in modern Diablo games. If you're able to navigate a menu, your combat options are nearly limitless. In Baldur's Gate 3, you have a lot of the things I listed above. You have an expansive party lineup that you can control throughout battles and in the overworld. You can swap to your rogue and steal from the merchant another character is buying goods from. It also has an insanely expansive ability list by the end of the game. All of my footage here is from Act 1 at the beginning of the game, but I assure you that each individual character is loaded with potential actions at any moment. The fact that Baldur's Gate is turn-based makes so much mischief possible. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> where were we? <laughs> There was a woman who wanted to raise a Gith Yankee to adulthood as an experiment. She wanted to test the nature versus nurture argument. On my first playthrough, my friend Steve and I agreed and handed over our Gith Yankee egg we had acquired quite ethically. Steve immediately stole the egg back. We still got the quest rewards, but now she can't torture that poor Gith. In my other playthrough, I got to see the results of her nurture. Let's just say things were going great for the, you know, all parties went that boy in her custody. Now I'm sure if you followed any Baldur's Gate content, then you've seen some of the wild stuff that people have done. I don't have any footage of stacking a million crates to do thousands of damage or anything like that, but those combinations are made possible by those gameplay systems. If you've got an example of a real-time game that allows for that, feel free to comment below. I started this video by saying I fucking love cyberpunk. Need I show you my friend's samurai skills again? That kind of visceral and satisfying gameplay is just not possible in turn-based games. You press the buttons, you feel skilled. It just feels good. The benefits of an action system are almost self-explanatory. Who cares if your party is smaller or not being controlled by you if you feel like the lord of the battlefield? Real-time systems can feel more mechanically challenging and engaging you feel more directly in control and immersed. You'll also likely feel more accomplished. You get the gamer cred. I started this rant about Baldur's Gate and I promised I would circle back. In Baldur's Gate, you don't get the gamer cred for being a Chad with the sticks, but you do get a completely different kind of satisfaction. Because you have complete control of every member in your party, you can set up some brilliant coups on the battlefield. You can use the positioning of your party to lure enemies into traps. In the goblin camp, I use my ranged fighters to hit goblins on the ground from the rafters 
while casting Cloud of Daggers on the one entry to the room my friend Steve was waiting in with all our fighters. We took almost no damage while clearing out a giant room of enemies. This leads to a different kind of satisfaction. This was still early in my playthrough and I still had a lot to learn about the game's systems and the Dungeons and Dragons 5e rule set. But in that moment, I felt like a tactical genius. This is a very different kind of satisfaction. Crafting a meticulous build for each new member of your party and then executing a plan based on those builds feels strategically satisfying. I know there's a group out there who just sees turn-based combat and instinctively they're turned off. If I can convince one person to try something out of their comfort zone, then I will feel my job is done here. Baldur's Gate 3 is one of the most mechanically satisfying games I've played in some time while also having some of the best character interactions I've ever experienced. The overarching story is simple and they definitely didn't try and redefine the genre. What this game does well is the same thing I remember the original Baldur's Gate doing well many years ago. Feels like a group of friends going on an adventure. More than almost any game I can recall in some time, you explore, meet a new group of people, who give you a new problem that you can solve in a variety of ways. Or you can choose not to solve it at all and just kill all those people and rob them. Why not? This is your story after all. Every time you reach a new settlement or meet a different group of people on the road, it's a new opportunity for the game to surprise you. Look what we got here. Another little birdie wanting to fly. Stop this thing! <laughs> <laughs> so there's a brake lever and a release brake lever. You doing release? Uh oh. <laughs> oh wow, that's moving quite fast. <laughs> what the? Oh, birdie, you just flew away! It's an opportunity that they often cash in. At the beginning of the game, the story is set up as you and a group of others escape a Mind Flayer ship after a tadpole works its way into your eye socket. The early portion of the game is heavily dominated by your party trying to find someone to remove said tadpole. The tadpoles turn their hosts into Mind Flayers, and although something is helping prevent this transformation in you and your party, it makes sense why they'd be focused on having someone remove these invasive creatures. We met a lovely wizard scholar named Volo, and he promised Steve he had the knowledge and experience to remove the tadpole. I'm going to leave this cutscene almost in its entirety here, because if this isn't a fantastic sales pitch for Baldur's Gate, then I don't know what it is. He can't, it. like he's not going to be able to remove the over. thing. Yeah. So like, what's going to happen? Yeah, I don't know. Are you watching? I'm watching. Volo carefully holds one of your eyes open and begins to prod uncertainly with the oh needle. Oh god, oh god, I hate this. Yeah, let him carry on. The needle finds the gap between eyeball and socket. Volo oh god, finds, he's moving it way too much. To push. <laughs> I'm nervous just watching it. <laughs> Fuck it, I'm doing you're, it. You're in the pain now. shoots through your body as the needle snags on your optic nerve. I think I have it! The needle seesaws back and forth, oh. plucking the nerve like a harp string. No, oh, thank you! There's some obstacle in the way. I shall need a more robust implement. Oh my god. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, fuck it, I already pulled the, the oh my god. from your eye. Then reaching into his bag. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, no, no. Volo slowly brings the ice. No, I'm okay with it happening, but I don't like eye. watching this. No. Personally, Steven doesn't. Don't. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Oh, my God. Cold metal presses oh. against the skin. Everyone disapproves. Oh, no. And then, tap, tap, stab. Oh, Do you am feel I dead? Huh? I think we have to blight her on the run. Oh my god. 
Okay. This is the only way I get off. <laughs> um, pibble, 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 pibble is kind of cool, but. I agree. It's a feisty critter. Just. Oh my God. Jesus. Jesus. The pink from your brain with a violent jerk. Your um. eye plops down into the mud. No. Threat. He pauses, looks down at your eye, Threat. and recoils slightly as it sinks into the mud. You mother lover. Dude, we'll get there you a sweet There seems to be an amount of cosmetic damage. Please, try not to overexert yourself. You're what? in a rather fragile oh, state at present. I can't help but feel partly responsible. <laughs> there is something more I can do. This decision had fringe benefits as Volo gave Steve a robo eye to replace his original, and now his character had sea invisibility. Worth it. Oh. Okay, he fucked up my eye, but gave me a fake one that can see invisibility. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's pretty sweet. Oh, but my eye is not cool and glowy anymore. All right, I want to see myself in a conversation. Hang on a second here. What the fuck? I hated that. <laughs> that was awful. Wait, what? Oh, nobody wants to talk to me. Everyone disapproves of everything I've done. It's hard to know where to start a real sales pitch for Baldur's Gate 3 because its quality reaches nearly every aspect of the game. The music was enchanting. The art was stunning. Every interaction seemed to have some kind of choice that would have at least some measure of consequence. Even better than that, some of the bad choices you can make can lead to some of the most memorable outcomes. Sometimes you make a reasonable choice, but the rolls of the dice don't favor you. I did my fair share of save scumming, but it's really fun to live with the consequences of some of those moments to see where it takes you. Early in the game, I decided to, you know, fuck around and find out with a weak mind flare dying in the sand. You approach the dying monster. This is the thing that abducted you. You could end its life here and now, if only you didn't feel compassion. Compassion. Yes, you feel hate, and you deserve to be punished for it. You should be whipped, made to bow before this creature in shame. Well, no, it's that's not what I meant to... possessing your mind, forcing that's you That's not what I meant to press? Love it, but then the feeling slips. The creature's mind seems to focus elsewhere. Your mind spews, lusting for something that is gone. But then its grip claws back with a vengeance, a vice locking your mind into obedience. It needs sustenance to survive, and with your very body, <laughs> you can provide. Coward. <laughs> Shut up! Oh! <gasps> Is that good? Oh no. Should have kissed it. No. I should have kissed it. Oh my. What? Warm, wet tentacles wrap themselves around your head. And for the first time in your life, you're perfectly happy. Huh. Uh. Huh. Okay. 
I've never seen that happen. <laughs> well, that did not go well. Don't worry, I rated my wrong. With this first playthrough with Steve, I watched as someone hit a young tiefling child in the grove early in the game. So many people talked to me like I hit the boy myself. I just wanted to see what would happen. I persuaded the man to let the boy off with a warning, but the townspeople and the boy's friends did not forgive this trespass. We've known enough grief this 10 day traveler. Don't be the cause of more. Dude, I didn't hit the kid. You know what I mean? Like, I, just, I watched it happen because yeah, I wanted just, to see it play out. You just let a kid get hit. That's even worse. Now, in retrospect, this is pretty amusing to me, even if I was kind of a pillar of salt in the moment. If you've seen anything about this game, then you've likely seen montages of people blowing up barrels or stacking crates to accomplish various feats. Your ability to interact with the game world is insane. Shrink yourself down to get in a little tunnel or, you know, make yourself large to be able to pick something up heavy. The only game I've ever played with similar interactivity was Larian's prior title, Divinity Original Sin 2. If you think you can try something, Larian will likely reward you for your creativity. Oh, you know what? I want to try something. Drops you down below where you want to be. Sick. God. Damn. I was that was awesome. That much damage. Holy shit. That was awesome. Look, I know Larian didn't invent exploding barrels, but early on when I fire bolted one barrel and started a chain reaction. Ooh. Nice. I'm going to see if I can blow up those barrels with a fire bolt. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds good, right? Are you able to move right now? Okay, oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you killed two of them and fucked up the other two. Damn, one HP? That guy's gonna burn to death. The other one might also burn to death. Examine. Burning does one to four damage. He has four HP, so he might just die on his turn. God, I was so pumped. I found a random chest across the crevasse, and none of the characters were athletic enough to make the leap across the gap to get the chest. I was able to use my mage hand to fly across the gap and throw the chest to us. Can you... Can he, like, throw it? Like, if you have him selected and then right-click the chest, can he... Is it strong enough to, like, throw the chest? My mind and, well... I think you should... Oh, hell yeah. Oh, that'd be so sick if you could throw it. Oh! <gasps> shut up. Can you throw it all the way over here? Oh, shut I up! I can, and I did! <laughs> oh, yeah, get Let's the move. fuck out of here! Hell yeah! I've been waiting for this magic hand to come in clutch. The chest didn't have anything spectacular in it. But being able to use my wizard's abilities and access it made me smile. I spent 200 hours on my two playthroughs of this game. But I know in years to come, I'll definitely come back to screw around. I haven't even done my Dark Urge playthrough. For my closing thoughts, I'd like to leave a couple recommendations for new players. Firstly, make sure you have one character with Speak With Animals. If you don't have the ability to talk to the wildlife, you are absolutely missing out. I've got nothing left to take, so you might as well shove off. Steel. Eagles are bigger. They just take. Nest. Prey. Everything. That's how it works here. Oh, sure, a nest. But it's not my nest. That's up on the roof with the eagles. Eagles are pricks. I've been saying it for years. <laughs> Similarly, you want at least one character with guidance. Shadowheart has this by default as you start, and it adds an additional 1d4 roll to all of your roles in conversation, and it can make a serious difference. 
Also, while I'm referencing Shadowheart, I'm of the opinion that her subclass of the Arcane Trickster is the worst of the cleric subclasses, and a respec is only 100 gold. This is my first experience with Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, so I'm no expert, but I feel she could be more useful with a different subclass. You'll easily be able to recruit more companions than can be in your party at any given time, but you'll reunite to converse with them every time you make camp. Long resting renews all of your spell slots and many of your abilities, so make sure you take advantage. There are many plot scenarios that reveal themselves at your camp, so if you're trying to big dick it by avoiding rest, then you're likely missing out on potential companion interactions and story events. Lastly, if you have the luxury of friends, play this game with at least one of them. Like most things in life, it's more enjoyable with a friend at your side, and this game gives you that option. Comes the loot solo. <laughs> and this is what it's like when worlds go on. <laughs> Pretty sick. This way, officer. By the time I noticed the door was halfway open, his room was already like this. I've left the place untouched as you requested. Hmm. Whose room is this? Junpei Iori, a second year student. I've been trying to reach him on his cell phone, but he hasn't responded in the last half hour. <sighs> it was careless of me to let my guard down. The storm was attacked once in the past. Perhaps Iori himself is at fault here. However, if harm has fallen upon him as... I hate to say it, Kirijo-san, but he most likely... Huh? Kirijo-senpai? What the hell? Kurosawa-san? What's going on here? Iori? Where were you? I've been trying to get a hold of you. Huh? Oh, uh, it was hot. And the AC was busted, so I went to the manga cafe. But I fell asleep. Well, I'm just glad you're safe. So if it wasn't an attack, then it must have been theft. Why would the burglar target this room? Burglar? What else could it be? Someone clearly ransacked the place looking for something. Vandalizing a school dorm. When I find out who did this, I'll see to it that they face a swift execution. Well, son, sounds like you've got a death sentence. How about it, Iori? Was this room really vandalized? Ah, uh, well, this is how my room always looks? What? But, I mean, you can't possibly live like this, can you? What about the door? It was open. Oh, well, that? I was just airing the place out while I was gone. No one we don't know ever comes around, so... Huh. I think this case is closed. May I get back to my duties now, young lady? Oh, uh, yes. I'm sorry you had to witness something so disgraceful. <gasps> I apologize for all this. It seems I grew up more sheltered than I realized. Persona 3 Reload launched into Game Pass. I played Persona 2 Eternal Punishment on PS1, but I remember almost none of it. Persona 3 was the first game that utilized what most would consider the modern Persona gameplay formula. Much like many others, Persona 5 was my first foray into these modern titles. Getting to play a remade version of Persona 3 was an amazing experience for me. It was a much simpler and more inviting experience than Persona 5 was. I'm not going to lie. I did not know what I was doing for many hours of my Persona 5 playthrough. I treat these games like I treat dating sims. I play them making all the decisions and conversation that I would make, and I befriend the characters and partake in the activities that I want to engage in. As such, I was far from 100% completion in my Persona 5 file. I only maxed out the social links with a couple of characters. In Persona 3 Reload, with the same playstyle, I was able to max out almost every social link without any real stress. 
Not only are there less systems to engage in than the later titles, the game is more streamlined and approachable in a lot of ways. If you haven't played a Persona game, but you've always been interested in them, I think Persona 3 Reload would be an amazing start to your journey. Let me take a step back and give the basic overview of the Persona 3 format for the uninitiated. Much like many of the other Persona games, your main character is arriving in a new town. For Persona 3, that means an island city called Iwotodai. He leaves the train station just at the chime of midnight, and the clocks suddenly stop. Electronics stop functioning. He's a goth gamer. This isn't distressing to him. The streets are filled with coffins. The moon is green. This is how he experiences life through his jaded eyes. The pools of blood covering the ground reflect back his own darkness. Okay, I'm going to stop with that bit. Uh, the point is, midnight's the witching hour. When he arrives at his new dorm, he's greeted by an ominous child that asks him to check in. And then shortly after, he meets his dorm mates who are packing heat, and their explanation is suspect at best. They are fake guns? This is their hobby, and the fake guns are for self-defense. Sure. Eventually, the clocks start to tick, and the world comes back to life. The next day, he starts his new life at his new school. This starts the game loop proper. Your character will go to school, take pop quizzes, and then be released to handle the day as he see fits. The days are split into morning, after school, and evening. Each of these time chunks gives you an opportunity to spend time making new friends or getting closer to existing ones. These friendships are called social links. You can boost social stats, which open new opportunities to partake in new activities and meet more new people. This is also the block of time where you can partake in small quests and buy items in the real world for the other portion of the Persona game loop. Every night, when the clock strikes midnight, the world freezes and dark monsters called shadows roam the world. Only certain sensitive people can remain awake during this time. But there have been reports of many youths disappearing, and the protagonist and his merry band are of the opinion that these things are related. If you so choose, you can use your evening block of time to explore an area referred to as Tartarus that reveals itself at school. The Persona games utilize a turn-based combat system with a heavy emphasis on weakness-based damage. In Tartarus, you aren't just clearing out the shadows. You're unraveling the mystery of the Dark Hour itself, as well as armoring your crew with better gear and better Personas. As you kill enemies, you can collect these different Personas, which give you the bulk of your magic powers. They have their own elemental affinities and weaknesses along with their own skill sets. The battle segments of Persona games are as much of a collect-a-thon as they are a combat gauntlet. These collected Personas can also be fused together to make even more powerful Personas with a selection of skills and magic from each of the fused Personas imparted on the new creation. The beauty of Persona is the incredibly complex web that it weaves. When you spend time with your friend in the real world, it makes them more capable during the dark hour. Every road you travel is at the expense of the road you didn't. You want to hang out and study with Mitsuru? You devil. I don't blame you. Here's the thing. Now you didn't go into Tartarus or work at the coffee shop. That means you didn't add anything to your charm social stat, and you gotta have max charm if you want to hang out with Yukari after all. As a completionist, this gives me nightmares in the later games. In Persona 3 Reload, I only used a guide for the test answers in class because well, just once I want to be on the top of my class, okay? Don't you judge me. Although there are tons of options for activities and people to hang out with, it was very straightforward. I didn't feel like I needed a guide. The user interface shows the areas of the city where you have pending social activities. Characters are only available to hang out with on certain times of certain days of the week. Having an easy UI demonstrating who's available to hang out right now makes it so simple to track. The other thing that made me enjoy the Persona 3 social interaction so much is that every conversation was so straightforward and easy. Afterwards, I played Persona 4, and I resorted to a guide to talk to my friends because I was choosing the poor answers, which meant I wasn't leveling up my relationships fast enough. Some of these conversations had to be answered perfectly as to efficiently level up a huge cast of characters. In most cases, the conversations in Persona 3 were very straightforward, and I loved the cast of characters. 
I didn't capture any of my conversations with him since all of my footage is early game, but my favorite social link was Akinari. If you know, you know. I only recorded the first portion of this playthrough because I was planning on making a video of something like the bit I'm doing right now. Short and sweet, recommending the game and explaining it. You know you're the type who's interested in a game like this. There are some who are scared off of Persona 5 because they don't want to commit to spending like 120 hours on a game when they're already unsure of it. I got all but one achievement in Persona 3 and I finished it somewhere around 70 hours. If you've been on the fence with Persona, give this one a try. I also recorded the entirety of my Persona 4 Golden Run after I finished this one with plans to make a day-by-day -day exhausting playthrough synopsis of that game. Out of curiosity, would anyone be actually interested in anything like that? Here. <laughs> Ghostwire Tokyo started off strong. I'm going to start with the premise and what I felt was solid about this game. Our protagonist Akito is racing through the streets of Shibuya when a mysterious fog causes him to crash into another vehicle. His body is then promptly inhabited by a spirit who will eventually be named KK. This leads to a power struggle over Akito's body. The one positive from this power struggle is that with the two of them in control they are able to withstand the powers of the fog. Every mortal soul that encounters this fog vanishes into a pile of clothes. The only remaining residents of the city seem to be otherworldly ghosts marching through the streets. A man in a Hanya mask calls to the vagrant souls and claims that he can grant them redemption. He says they will be the foundation for a new world. A suitable vessel has been readied for your arrival. Whatever the hell that means. Akido is being protected by KK. Without his powers, he would likely already be dead from his wreck or just more clothes for the pile. Early on, Akido is learning how to use KK's powers for his protection and wandering the surreal empty streets of Shibuya. He has to find his sister though. She was lying unconscious in the hospital at the precipice of death. In order to find her though, he has to fight through enemies that are busy harvesting souls that have escaped their bodies like the people in the piles of clothes in the streets. Akido is tormented by visions of his sister Mari the closer he gets to her. When he enters the room, the man in the Hanya mask is waiting at her bedside. Mari has one foot in this world and one in the next. It's not explained how yet, but she's an integral part of our foe's plan. Akido is not strong enough to save his sister. He has to watch as the enemies abscond with her. He isn't done yet though. KK again saves them from the brink of death and brings them back. So now it's time to cleanse the city of these invaders and find his sister. A solid setup. I wanted to save Mari and learn about Akito and KK, find out about the origins of the man in the Hanya mask, and explore the streets of Shibuya all while cleansing enemies in my way. By clearing out enemies and activating assorted Tori gates strewn about the city, you could clear away fog and grant yourself access to previously inaccessible areas of the city. I really enjoyed a lot of the small side quests littered around the city. They'd often be setups about a haunted apartment or a brother tormented by a spirit that turned out to be something inhabiting a cursed doll. Small little compartmentalized mysteries that were in tight linear locations. These were usually when I felt the game was doing the best job of using the tools that this setting provides to be super weird. Ghostwire is great at giving backstory on Japanese folklore and Japanese culture in general. I took this game as a learning experience to educate myself on the origins of different yokai or the functions of temples. This game looks stunning and they did a great job of providing a really surreal, dark experience. 
Being in a city that's usually densely populated with a distinct lack of population is also a really specific vibe. I enjoyed that a lot. Plus, I love seeing a giant ghost parade meander through the streets. So, said lots of good things. Where did it fail me then? Well, first off, this is an open world game, so you remember that whole setup I just gave? They kind of forget about that crap, and you feel like you're just screwing off doing nonsense for the next 10 hours or so before the plots really moved along forward. The bulk of the content in Ghostwire seemingly has nothing to do with KK or Akito specifically. There were initially times where I enjoyed some of this stuff, but I was drawn in by the initial setup and then I got serious blue balls while waiting to get more of their actual story. I'll be honest, I don't think I ever really got combat in Ghostwire. To start with, it's the kind of game where you start off with relatively few combat options and it takes hours to build up a decent amount of actual skills to use in battle. I don't think this type of game really needed a skill tree, but every game has one now, and they needed a carrot on the end of the stick to fuel the collectibles, so I guess it makes sense from someone's perspective. There's a very rudimentary stealth system, and you're encouraged to use it because it's a much faster way to deal with enemies, since all of your magic is so slow and methodical, and each enemy takes numerous blasts to take them down. If you sneak up from behind, it's a one-hit kill. I've spoken about how bad I am at games a lot of times, probably in this video as well. But I'm also certain high level play in Ghostwire isn't going to differ very wildly from mine, as there's only three magic types and not a huge amount of different abilities to use. There are parries and a dash, but even with those, the combat felt sluggish. If you're charitable with it, you could say the combat is deliberate. There's a bit of rock, paper, scissors going on with the enemies that are weaker to one school of magic than others, but you're also encouraged to save your blue and red magic because green magic is far more plentiful for refill. I never hated combat in Ghostwire, just to say it, but I never really felt engaged enough to do more than just get by. My biggest problem with Ghostwire is there are so many collectibles in this game, it's mind-bottling. It's so crazy that your thoughts get all trapped like in a bottle. It's not just that there is too many of one type of collectible. There are too many of like 30 kinds of collectibles. I love shinies, guys. Collecting stuff is literally my jam. This game is just so goddamn much. All those people that can bust it in a pile of clothes are now spirits floating around the city. You have a Katashiro that can capture these spirits, but every single one of the floating spirits has to be tediously captured. It's not just finding them, but capturing them is so absolutely time consuming. Not only that, but your Katashiro gets full of spirits and it has to be deposited in a ghost trap, so there's yet another hindrance to this process. There's a total of 240,300 spirits to capture in the city. You can only capture at most a hundred at a time. It's an absurd number to collect. It's such an absurd number to collect that I felt ridiculous doing so after a certain point. There are different kinds of yokai to capture in East District, and I enjoyed capturing each of them for the first time. Then I realized that there are a number of each type littered all over the map. After the third Kodama, I was no longer amused. You get it. This game just has too much of everything. You'll notice that when I discuss my gripes about the game, it was almost all systems and mechanics and stuff like that. This game had a really awesome premise and a gorgeous world to inhabit. I love representations of Japan, and I'm very much into the contemporary setting especially. I like ghost shit. I like surreal and messed up imagery. This game does all that part well, which I think should be the hard part. I never stopped being into walking around this world. The game got in its own way to me. Honestly, I still have rose-tinted glasses looking back on the game because I was so into what it was trying to do. In my dream version of Ghostwire Tokyo, they would have cut down on the size of Shibuya, make the collection of the spirits less tedious and way less plentiful, cut down the sheer amounts of collectibles, make it so you only have to catch one of each type of yokai, 
kept all of the side quests. All those were good and minimized the number of Tory gates and focused on just adding a bit more into the main storyline. This game could easily be a top tier game to me. As it stands now, it's kind of harder to recommend. There's definitely something here to like, but it's bogged down by content that's monotonous. I'm glad I spent the time to play it, but I also anticipate that this game will likely inspire mixed opinions. Some people are going to love it, and some people are going to hate it. I'm some people, and I love it and hate it. We're in the whole ages, just like our coffee. So, take a sip of our Oh Dear Diner organic coffee and let the adventure begin! Hold on for dear life on the Espresso Express! Oh! Soak in some local history at the Huatari Well, where two serial killers once hid the disemboweled bodies of their murder victims. Uh, it's not haunted. No. <laughs> Come join Mocha Moose and the goats at our amusement park petting zoo. Just don't share your coffee with the goats. <laughs> Seriously, stop feeding our goats coffee. Seriously. It's not amusing. Take in amazing views from the slow roaster Ferris wheel. I can almost see the Warrior Lighthouse trailer park. This is so much fun. And finish off at our beautiful gift shop where seniors and children under 10 receive a 9% discount on keychains and propane tanks. Welcome to Coffee World. We guarantee you'll jaw a great time. One of my first videos that got 10,000 views was a video on Alan Wake. I also made videos on Quantum Break and Control. I'm still terrible at making videos, but my early Remedy videos really make me cringe. <laughs> Although my videos were bad, I now consider myself a Remedy Games enjoyer. I bought Alan Wake 2 day one, on the Epic Game Store no less. I will wait for any game that releases on that storefront to come to Steam. Well almost any game. Epic Games funded Alan Wake 2. This earned them my money, in my opinion. I had every intention of making a full recap of this game, and then I finished it. I loved Alan Wake 2. It's awesome, but it's also non-linear and really peculiar. The game is split between chapters for Alan and chapters for a new character named Saga Anderson. I played these chapters in a very strange order. Then I thought about what a proper order would look like. I don't know, man. Even though I love the narrative of this game, actually retelling it felt daunting to me. Saga Anderson's segments take place predominantly in the town of Bright Falls, while Alan spends the bulk of the game in an alternative universe version of New York City. Alan's segments tend to lean heavy into the surreal because they can alter the world at a drop of a hat. He has a mechanic where he can rewrite a scene to his advantage. It's pretty wild to see the exact same location transform in front of your eyes based on Alan editing his manuscript. I was so impressed with what this game brought to the table visually. From this angle, Alan's game segments really stood out because they were so much more supernatural than Saga's. Saga is an FBI agent. She plays more like a cop. She could take pieces of evidence and examine the facts from her mind palace. From a gameplay perspective, I tend to favor Saga's bits. It was cool to catch a better glimpse of a more realized Bright Falls. There are always secrets you could backtrack to areas for, but it was more obvious progression through her story uh, as opposed to Alan's more open-ended segments. The original Alan Wake was a simplistic action game where supplies were always numerous. The sequel went more in a survival horror direction with safe rooms and stashes and a limited inventory. To be honest, I never felt starved for supplies after the early hours, but it gave me the illusion to be fearful of. I spend a lot of time apologizing for not being great at games. Remember just that last segment? But I'm gonna do it again. This game had melee options and strafing, and I didn't use any of it too often. I was not good at this combat. I played on normal and I was constantly taking tons of hits. I still had plenty of healing potential thanks to my proclivity for exploration, so I wouldn't say I really struggled. 
but I never really felt competent. Your enemies take a lot of hits to bring down, and your reload speeds are painfully realistic and slow for a lot of your weapons. You're never fighting just one foe, so you're best off switching weapons rather than reloading. The strace and melees also reset your reload animation, so I tended to just favor tanking the hit and finishing what I started. I guess I never really found the right balance in the combat. I didn't dislike it in Alan Wake 2, but I just wanted to admit my own failings and hang-ups with the combat. One thing that's become a staple of Remedy games is their use of characters from their extended universe. There's a ton of small easter eggs and full-on characters from other franchises. Ati from Control reveals himself early on. They don't even try and hide these references. They leave them right out in the open. If someone decided to play Alan Wake 2 as their first Remedy game, I'm certain they could follow the plot and enjoy it, but they'd be missing out on a wealth of context from other games. Like I said, I really enjoyed Alan Wake 2, but I don't know how to organize my thoughts for a long form video. The music and art is amazing. Remedy does a great job of making their games stand out artistically with their art and world building, and this is no exception from that praise. If you liked Alan Wake, I can't imagine you not enjoying the sequel. I just don't recommend that you start here with the Remedy Extended Universe. Start with Alan Wake or Control. You'll find more to like with the sequel if you have further context from its surrounding universe. Okay, this last segment's going to be really rapid fire because I just want to acknowledge playing these games, but for a variety of reasons, I have less to say. I wanted to make a pair of Hellblade videos. These games did not want to record properly. I swear, I had a hell of a time recording these games. After replaying long segments and realizing that the videos were corrupt or not capturing properly, I gave up on this idea. I think it's some way... I don't... You know what? I don't need, I'm not even going to hypothesize. As such, I'm just going to leave this footage of Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice up. I loved Senua's Sacrifice. It looked gorgeous, and the sound design combined with the tight camera perspective really made me feel her constant pain. The first game introduces her character and gives you her backstory and a great setup for her motivations. The combat was simple and the puzzles were doubly so, but she was struggling with mental health issues and having her reassemble visions of patterns in the world made perfect thematic sense. It isn't a game for everyone. For some people, they'll dismiss it as a walking simulator. Those people need to play Dear Esther though, like to be honest. But if the gameplay isn't tense enough or engaging enough for some, then that's a fine enough reason to dislike it. There are others who can't handle it because the voices that taunt Senua are too disturbing. My brother-in-law is one of those people. Especially if you have um, mental health issues running in your family, this game and its sequel might hit close to home. This voice work and sound design is probably the best in the business. The first time I played this game, there's a moment where she's being taunted by her and her voices, and it doesn't just affect her, it affected me. Are you scared? You should be scared. You're in danger. Just drop down. What's down? Why did she do that? She shouldn't have done it. She can't go back now. <laughs> no, this is it. The hidden path. They were manipulating her and making me second guess myself. She carries memories of her friend Druth, and his performance is fucking nails. Druth was rad as hell. Who are you? It's just a memory. Druth? Is that you? For my tales of the Northmen, they call me Druth. A liar. He's lost. An old fool. <laughs> Druth is my truth. So yeah, I really love the original title. I bought it for $30 the day it launched. The experience probably lost me about 7 hours. It was worth my $30 to me at the time how you value your money and games i that's up to you i'm not going to try and tell you you're right or wrong on that now senua saga has released and it was the controversial follow-up senua saga has less of those environmental puzzles in combat 
there's just less gameplay in general. The first game has plenty of areas where you're walking for periods of time while examining the world around you, but there are many more prolonged segments of almost no real gameplay in its sequel. Just lots of walking in a straight line while barely engaging with the world. People who proclaim that the first game was a walking simulator have a more honest claim here. I like the sequel, but I have to admit that it takes steps forward in some ways and backwards in others. The biggest thing that bothered me was that her inner voices no longer seemed to be working against her. Where her voices in her head seem to be a wave of different perspectives in the first game, they seem more like a typical narrator or tutorial voice in Senua's Saga. Before you had to wade through the voices and determine which were providing a wise perspective. These voices would bicker, they would argue. In Senua's Saga, they're less prevalent as use as a hindrance or an obstacle. In fact, the world seems to see her visions as a whole as a positive. She meets several people who see her strange view on the world as something to value. Whereas in her origin story, the prior title, this is what made her an outsider. This is why she valued Druth and her beloved Dillian so much. They were two people who loved her for who she was. It's just weird that in the sequel, this angle seemed to melt away. I didn't hate Senua's Saga, but some of the strongest elements of the first game seem to be diminished in my perspective. There's no doubt that the game is still stunning on a technical level, and Melina Jurgen's performance as Senua is still amazing. I've said it before about other games, but I'm glad I played it. I just also think it's harder to defend against the type of people who are already against it. I'd recommend the first game almost universally if you have Game Pass or if you catch it on a sale. I think I bought the Steam version for 5 bucks. The second title is worth a look on Game Pass, that's, that's an easy investment, or if it goes on a deep sale. Having said that, you know from Jump Street if you're the type of player interested in these games. If you're not, that's also cool with me man. You don't gotta like everything I do. I feel bad for making these games a more truncated segment in a video like this, but goddamn recording these was just bewitched from Jump Street. It just wasn't meant to be. The video I really wanted to make just wasn't gonna happen. After playing Baldur's Gate, I've been reacclimating myself to other CRPGs. I figured this would also be a good time to play the Pillars of Eternity games. I'm really excited to play Avowed, and the Pillars of Eternity games take place in the same universe. Or the same world, specifically. Initially, I had considered doing a recap or a lore dump video. I realized almost instantly that these games are crazy dense, and someone out there would likely do a much better job of reframing the world that these games take place in. Having said that, why don't I do a really short and sweet setup? These games take place in the world of Aora. In this world, a person's death returns them to the wheel. The wheel recirculates their soul into a newborn in this universe's version of reincarnation. One of the main conflicts in the first game is that the infants born in an area called the Deerwood are suffering from being hollowborn, or being born without souls. You'll encounter different means that people have adopted to treat the hollowborn situation with mostly dire consequences. Aora has a pantheon of gods with varying motivations. You're constantly encountering temples or disciples from these assorted gods. But most of these people in the world of Aora don't get to encounter these gods directly, only feel their effects. The protagonist in both games is a watcher. Someone who can see into people's souls and experience moments of their past lives, different turns of the wheel, if you will. In both games, this ability to sense someone's past lived experiences can help to guide you to where to go next, or make a more educated choice on how to deal with a situation. The second game allows you a more direct interaction with the gods than the first. As a watcher, you play an important part in the fate of the world of Aora. And in the second game, the gods try and sway your decisions, and it's up to you to take the path you see fit. Pillars Eternity 1 has more a feel of a level 1 Dungeons & Dragons campaign. It kind of, the same compliments I paid towards Baldur's Gate 3 earlier, I would pay towards this game. You play in the Deerwood, which is just one small area in the greater world of Aora. You feel like you're just a level 1 adventurer at the start, and I was kind of charmed by it. 
The early game has walls of text that can feel a bit overwhelming and impenetrable as a new player, but it will also be very welcome for those trying to get a greater grasp on the lore of this universe. Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire takes place in the Deadfire Archipelago. You have to get a boat, recruit a crew, who will then have to be properly fed and maintained, lest you deal with a mutiny, all while exploring the Deadfire Islands in the pursuit of a dead god returned. If I were to recommend one or the other, I'd recommend the second game to a new player, to be honest. There's more voice acted dialogue, and they do a good enough job of onboarding new players to learn about different races and factions in the world. I think the second game is more approachable for the wider gaming audience. But if you are more of a veteran of the classic CRPG genre, the first game is still great and worth it if you're willing to take the time to do considerably more reading. I should note that even the second game is still a CRPG that will require ample reading, but you won't be met immediately with walls of text. Obsidian made the Pillars of Eternity games, but they also made a standalone CRPG called Tyranny. I didn't record my playthrough, but I wanted to include this game on the list, so... The Overlord Kairos has won. The world is under Kairos' control, and you're acting as his fate binder. Or, or her doesn't really specify if it's a him or a her. It's your job to help subdue the remaining rebellion in the last realm of the world that isn't completely under Kairos control. Kairos' army has two different factions, the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus. As the game plays out, you can ally with the factions or side against both of them. In my run, I sided with the Disfavored. I really enjoy the flavor of playing a game where you are the villain faction from Jump Street. You don't necessarily have to be outright evil. Subduing a rebellion can be done by making pragmatic decisions to gain the trust of your enemies and bringing them into the fold. There is a system that's consistently weighing in on your actions and decisions that determines how each faction sees you, and even how your party members see you. Should you spite the Archon of War for the Disfavored, you will earn Wrath, which will open further conversation options. You can also choose to befriend them and earn favor. The same is true of your companions. Sometimes sparing the rod for a teammate will grant them a new spell with higher favor. However, if you shut them down and remind them who is boss, it will open up new wrath options in combat. The system is awesome. The biggest problem with tyranny is that it's short. No, wait, that's not right. It's unfinished. I was aware of this before I started, but boy does that ending come out of nowhere. My whole first run took me about 25 hours, and that's being tremendously thorough. I would imagine someone rolling credits in significantly less time. Tyranny is highly replayable, and I'll definitely come back someday and do a Scarlet Chorus run. But at release, I can imagine the absolute blue balls I'd feel with that ending. In spite of its unfinished state, I think Tyranny is a great entry point for new players to the CRPG genre. It's got fun systems that I didn't talk about at all, um, so I'm sorry about that. But uh, if you want to be the bad guy and try out a pretty simple and low commitment CRPG, then give it a shot. Most of the time, someone goes, oh yeah, you should play Baldur's Gate 2. How long does it take to be? It's much longer. All right, I'm just going to tell you right now. It's going to take a lot longer. You want to play Baldur's Gate 3? <sighs> Have fun. It's going to be a while. Hopefully that cleared out a significant chunk of old footage for me. Uh, I want to get back and make some longer format videos dedicated to single games. Up next, I could cover my entire Wasteland 3 playthrough, a retelling of Final Fantasy VII Remake, or my Persona 4 run. Tell me what interests you in the comments. Also tell me if it was miserable to sit through or if you actually enjoyed a supercut of brief thoughts on games I played. I could do this in future with other games I've left to say about if people like this or just make sure to tell me your thoughts. Thanks for stopping by. Shep out.